Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at an introduction to nutrient cycles, the carbon cycle, the human impact on the carbon cycle, maintaining the balance of CO2 in the air, and then we'll finish with a summary. So on planet Earth we have a finite supply of the nutrients, and of course those nutrients are made of atoms, so there are a finite supply of atoms on our planet. Outside of the planet of course is just space, where there are no atoms. So all of the atoms on the planet are finite. What this means is that there is only a certain number of atoms in the entire planet, and it won't be changing. Therefore, the ecosystems and habitats do not have an infinite number of nutrients or atoms that they can use. So the number of atoms are finite. If they were infinite, then the ecosystem would just keep growing and growing until it grew to a massive size, because there's no need for limitations. In order to keep the habitats functioning, the resources, i.e. the atoms, have to be recycled so the organic components get broken down and rebuilt to be reused. So for example, plants use CO2. But of course, the next generation of plants needs to use CO2 as well. So when they take the CO2, it gets recycled into other organic forms and put back into the atmosphere. As it's put back into the atmosphere, we get CO2 recycled, and then the future plants can use it again. So it goes on and on and on. And this is the case for many different atoms and therefore many different types of nutrient. So carbon as an atom and an element is very important for life. It's found in carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. So when you look at the molecular structure of these different types of molecules, you can see that carbon is central to all of them. For example, here we have a carbohydrate, and you can see that carbon crops up in lots of different places in the molecule. It's found as the core part of amino acids found in proteins. So it's in each of the amino acids making up the chain. And it's also a part of lipids too, for example, in the phospholipid bilayer. The problem is there's only a finite supply of carbon on the planet, and so it has to be recycled through nature if life can continue to grow. And the way that it gets recycled is through something called the carbon cycle. So there's a finite amount of carbon in the planet, and so it has to be recycled through various processes so that life can keep using carbon to build up these important molecules. So we describe this cycle through a series of phases. First of all, animals carry out respiration to release carbon dioxide into the air. So we take in oxygen into our lungs and we metabolize at the tissues and these make the waste product which is CO2 and we breathe this out into the atmosphere. Plants and photosynthesizing organisms take up the carbon dioxide from the air and they use it in photosynthesis to so this aids in increasing the plant biomass. So in photosynthesis they use sunlight and carbon dioxide with a bit of water to make glucose and increase their biomass. The plants can then be eaten by animals, so the carbon that gets trapped in the biomass of the plants gets transferred to the animals. So if you think in a stepwise fashion, the carbon dioxide was in the air, then it got taken in by the plants and turned into the plant's biomass. And then of course herbivores come along, eat the plants, and the carbon that's in that biomass gets transferred into the animal instead. So these different processes form a food chain and eventually they will all die and be decomposed by detritivores. And the detritivores also respire to release carbon dioxide back into the air. So everything will die eventually, so animals and plants. The matter that they leave behind on the ground gets eaten up and digested, and eventually the detritivores carry out respiration for their own processes, and the carbon dioxide will be released into the atmosphere. If the plants aren't eaten by animals, the plants can die and either decompose or fossilize. Animals can also do the same as this, and they fossilize into what we call fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels are what we use by combustion engines to release CO2 into the air and provide energy for our machines. So for example, the animal here, which might have been a fish, becomes a fossil. This turns into different forms of fossil fuels, for example, oils. And then we harvest these fossil fuels which have been around for millions of years and we use it as a fuel which drives the movement of machines. And then this releases CO2 that was trapped in these molecules back into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide can also chemically react with water in the air, so for example in the rain, and this forms carbonic acid. And when the acid combines with the rain we form acid rain which can erode limestone and other types of stone statues releasing more CO2 into the air. 
So to sum that up in the diagram, we can have carbon dioxide in the air forming carbonic acid with water in the air. And then when it rains, the rain brings the carbonic acid down. So we call this acid rain. It erodes certain materials like limestone, and then this brings back out the CO2 again into the atmosphere. So it forms a kind of cycle. So the entire cycle with all of these processes can be shown diagrammatically. So it looks complicated, but each of these is only covering the steps we've talked about in this video. So for example, animals and plants both undergo respiration to release CO2 into the air. Animals can eat plants, and obviously the material going from the plant to the animal contains carbon. Both of them can die and end up being broken down by detritus and humus and waste, or organisms that feed on this. They decompose, releasing CO2 to the air as well. And of course, fossil fuels come from dead plants and dead animals, which can be combusted to release CO2 again. But plants also take CO2 out of the atmosphere in photosynthesis, and that's the only real process that takes CO2 away. So before the human interference, carbon dioxide levels in the air would fluctuate, so go up and down, according to the natural cycles. So the CO2 in the air is meant to change, and it is meant to go up and down naturally. But it seems that human activity is affecting the balance of CO2 in the atmosphere. So these can include certain activities like deforestation, so removing masses of trees across the planet, and using fossil fuels. For example, combustion engines are using lots of fossil fuels, which always releases an increased emission of CO2 into the air. So there's three types of fossil fuel, natural gas, oil, and coal. And for the last couple of hundred years, these have been used to fuel lots of different machines. And as these machines run, they release CO2 into the atmosphere. Deforestation for raw materials, like timber, means that there are less plants to trap the CO2 from the air into the plant's biomass. So this is also increasing the levels of CO2 in the air. So normally the trees would take CO2 in and store this as their biomass in photosynthesis. But of course, if we're removing the trees for wood, then the CO2 is not being absorbed and the levels of it rise in the air. However, we are trying to carry out methods to help restore the balance of carbon dioxide in the air. One method is using sustainable resources such as carbon neutral biofuels. So this is where we have carbon being trapped in photosynthesis, which is equal to the carbon released by combustion. So by using fuels, which come from plants, like sugar, starch and cellulose, they trap CO2 into their biomass because they are plants carrying out photosynthesis, and they can make fuel, which can then fuel our machines. Of course, this releases CO2 back into the atmosphere, but it will get absorbed back into the plants again. If the amount released is equal to the amount absorbed, then this is sustainable. We can also try reforestation and planting on previously destroyed land to increase the number of carbon dioxide trapping organisms. So again, if we increase the number of trees, we get more absorption of CO2 from the atmosphere because they all carry out photosynthesis and therefore this reduces the level in the air. The use of these procedures could help lower and restore the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.